Okay. Okay. Welcome to Baking Tips and Tricks. My name is Sandy Page, and I'm happy to have people here in the classroom. We have four in the classroom, and then we have people out in uh, YouTube land. And because we're social distance, we made sure we're the distance we should be. I'm going to take my mask off uh, um, so that you can understand me better. My voice isn't, people have hard time hearing me sometimes. So the class is, this semester is going to be just a tad different. I actually started it last semester. And while I'm teaching, for you ladies here in the room, and Ben too, if you have anything that wasn't, isn't clear or that you would like to add or you'd like to ask, please just break in and do it. With the light, I can't especially see if you have a handout, so just, it doesn't bother me if you just break in and say, what about, or I don't agree, or whatever you want to add to it. For the semester, for this term, we're going to have class three Tuesdays in a row, today, the 19th and 26th. And what we're going to do today, I'm going to talk about my favorite tools, and it's called Essential Tools and Ingenious Gadgets. And I actually lifted that right from Cook's Magazine. I'm not so clever to think up that title. But I'm going to talk about what I think are the best things you should have in the kitchen. And then we'll talk about it. And actually, it's the same I the items that Cook's, Cat Cat Cook's Magazine recommended, although I took some of the things out that they recommended, and I added a few of my own. And I thought, well, let's see what Martha Stewart says, because I like Martha Stewart. And she had several of the same things. She tends to push her own products, which I don't think are especially good, but she had a lot of the same tools. And then, lo and behold, last term when I was teaching this, the very morning that I had this session, a chef on TV was talking about his favorite tools. So that's what we're going to go through today. And then after we do that, I'm going to talk, I'm going to discuss my favorite baking tips. And then pull that out, my favorite tips for making cookies, my favorite tips for making cake, for making pies, and then for making biscuits and scones. Okay, and then next week, I'll demonstrate making a roll dough. And I actually have something new that I'm excited about that I've never done in this class before. And you might have read about it. If you read about baking bread, it's called Tang Zong. Has anyone heard about Tang Zong? It's, it's a Japanese technique. It's very simple. It sounds like it's more cosmic than it is. You take either water, and it's 2 thirds cup, and a fourth cup of flour, I believe is the proportion, or two-thirds cup uh, milk and a fourth cup flour. And whisk that up, put it in the microwave for 10 seconds, take it out, whisk it, put it back in until it's like a paste, like a roux, and start your bread with that. And that gives your bread more structure. It makes it last longer. And I'm going to give you that recipe. And King Arthur just came out with the recipe of their year, of the year, their recipe of the year, and it was a Tang Song recipe. So we'll do that next week, and I will demonstrate making traditional bread and uh, doing some roll shaping. And then the last week, I'd like people, there's my, my email address. Don't hesitate to send me an email, but put something in the subject line. And this is for everyone out in uh, YouTube land, too. If you have anything you want to ask, anything you want to add, or anything you want to request for that last class, please let me know. But I'm planning to talk about artisan bread and sourdough and doing your own starter, and then a, a technique of making a roll, slashing it, and then twisting it. it. It makes a pretty little braid, and we're going to do that with a savory filling. I thought you all might like that for Easter time. So that's what we're going to do in the three sessions. So right now, we'll start talking about my favorite tools and, and gadgets. Okay, and you know what I should say, and I always tell my classes this, much of what I say is my opinion. A recipe isn't my opinion, or, or facts about, um, about the cooking basics. But a lot of what I say is my opinion, and 
that doesn't mean it's, it's the gospel truth. You might disagree with it, and what, what I say isn't necessarily exactly right. Um, okay, so we're going to start out with what I think are the most important and work our way down. And I have about, I think about 20 items up here. So first is a good set of measuring cups. Oh, I know what I, I thought. There's something else I wanted to tell you. You can be a wonderful cook or baker with nothing but a bowl and a spoon. You know, some people don't even need measuring cups. Now, I don't know how that happens, but some people know it by, by feel. A lot of people say, my grandma always did it by feel, but no, I need a measuring cup to start for sure, and I need all these gadgets. But you want a liquid measure for liquids, and you want dry measure for dry. And when you work with a liquid measure, make sure you look at it straight on. You don't want to look down at it or up at it, because that can keep it from measuring accurately. And then dry measure. And um, you know what dry measuring are of graduated sizes. And when you're measuring flour or cornstarch or uh, powdered sugar, something that settles, you shouldn't dip. You should spoon it in and then level it off for the dry measure. And by the way, I always sift my flour. And you don't have to. Most flour, I think all flours now are pre-sifted, but I think it makes a nicer product when you do. And there is a difference. Read the recipe. There's a difference between a cup of sifted flour and a cup of flour sifted. You know, if you take a cup of flour, put it in a sifter, you'll probably end up with a cup and an eighth or a cup and a fourth of flour. So that's something important to know. And then, of course, a good set of measuring spoons. And the same thing, you want flat handles so you can level it off. Okay, then the next thing I put up here, I had a hard time deciding what should those most important six tools be. I put in scrapers. I think a scraper is really important. And about a year ago, I was reading in a, it was in Bake from Scratch, I'm going to talk about that, about a brand called G-I-R. And I, I looked online today because I wanted to see up to how hot can you work with these, up to 500 degrees. And it, it had about five stories about GIR, best spatula, best ratings. And they are a little bit pricey. These are both GIRs and they have a lot of different sizes. They're flexible and yet they're really strong. And they're all in one solid piece. They aren't two pieces put together. By that, I mean like this. You know, this has a top on it. This one is good and solid, but I had one at home, and I have quite a few at home, that those tops would come off. And when I put them in the dishwasher, they would get stuff down in them. So yeah, I think, I really need to take them apart. Well, that's a pain to take it apart, but you still can't get it very clean. So I threw all of them away. And I thought I really should have kept at least one to be able to show my classes what I mean. But I think you all know what I mean. You want something that's really good and put together solid. And then I make a lot of bread. That's my specialty. So then I also need a, a, a firm spatula that when you get in and can get the bread dough scooped out. So a nice firm spatula. So spatulas are a good thing to have. A whisk. Oh my goodness. I use my whisk so much. I have Oh, I must have at least four of this size, and then I have big sizes. But I use these whiskey froth eggs, mix, uh, mix a roux, just, I'm, I'm constantly using these whisks. And I generally use the dishwasher for things, but you can't put your whisk in the dishwasher. And the reason, there's a little plate, I don't know if you can zoom in on this, there's a little plate up at the top of the tines, and it's not stainless steel. I, the tines are all stainless steel and everything else is stainless steel. But because that's not, and that's the way all the whisks are. Anyhow, the ones I've seen. Uh, then that gets rusty. And I don't think you want anything, I, I don't know if rust is toxic or not, but I don't want any rust dropping in my food. They aren't very expensive. I think it was 79 cents at Harmon's, so I'm sure you can get them even cheaper somewhere else. But why replace it all the time if you, there's nothing else that wears out in a whisk, so that's a very handy little tool to have. It's an easy way to clean those, too, if you take it, pinch it together so all the things come together, you can just wipe it off really easy. Oh, okay. Learn that. You mean that the, the up here, squeeze it together up here? Yeah, where it's flexible, and then they all, all the loops come together. 
Oh, okay. What with a brush, I suppose. Oh, okay. Well, good. Thank you. Good. Okay. Next, next thing I have up here is a palm peeler, and this is all a matter of taste. If not a palm peeler, at least a good vegetable peeler at home. I started using a palm peeler about ten years ago. It slips right over my finger, and they're really handy to use. Um, um, and by the way, I don't want to forget to tell you, our Ace Hardware stores have a lot of nice kitchen things. They have a nice kitchen uh, tools and gadgets section. So, um, but I, I tend to throw these away because accidentally, not on purpose. <laughs> I, because um, I don't use a garbage disposal much for environmental purposes. And I get this lost in my peelings and throw it away. So I usually keep two of these on hand. And, I told that last semester, and lo and behold, I threw one away that very next week and didn't have any other at home. I thought, well, that's funny. I just talked about that. So good, there's that. Um, next, I'm going to talk about a rasper and, or a grater. And I have several different sizes of these, but I think if you have only one, this is a good size. Um, I, uh, it's just a regular rasper. I have a bigger one. I use it for cheese. I use it for nuts, for garlic. But what I really like it for, and here's this is more a cooking tool. When we get oranges or lemons or limes or grapefruit, I wash it real well. I often wash fruits and vegetables in white vinegar to try to counteract any chemicals that might be on them. And then rasp it or um, zest it. And I. I wash the fruit real well and then zest it and put a little baggie, a little Ziploc bag of lemon peel, a little bag of orange peel or, or zest. Or, and I have one recipe that calls for grapefruit, because grapefruit cookies and lime. And then when a recipe calls for, you know, I'll call for a half teaspoon of zest, pull it out of the freezer and you have it. And you can also do the same with juice. Take a you know, orange juice and put in an ice cube tray and then just grab a cube of that juice when you have a recipe that calls for a little juice. Or it's nice just to add a little lemon sometimes to things. So, okay, I'm getting hung up here. Try it this way. Okay, then a pastry brush. Um, I, I, I brush my bread with egg. I brush pies with egg or with milk or whatever you're brushing it with. And most uh, chefs in, in cooking catalogs recommend a natural bristle brush. And I have, I have a little bowl. I keep all my brushes. I must have six or seven natural bristle brushes. Well, that's a tongue twister. <laughs> but the reason I don't like to use them, I don't feel like I can get them really clean. This one is silicone, and then this is stainless steel. So I can put this in the dishwasher and I know it's nice and clean. And I just, this morning I was going through all my notes so I'd be ready for you all. And here on the last page of uh, this Cooks, one of these Cooks magazines, it recommends a silicone pastry brush. So I thought, well, that's interesting. They agree with me on that. So an, a pastry brush and then a bench knife. I use my bench knife a lot. You shouldn't tear bread dough and you shouldn't tear pie dough or biscuit dough, cut it and use a knife. Or I just like this bench knife. It's also handy to scrape up uh, chopped vegetables or onions, whatever you're, you might have. But I use that a lot. Okay, a can opener. And um, I read if you have something with a longer handle, it has more leverage. I don't know why do you need leverage with a can opener. I don't know, but I, that was what I just read. Okay, uh, I'm trying to do from most important to least important. Uh, a colander is uh, really nice to have to wash fruits and vegetables, to drain things that you're cooking. I, this, I brought this one in because it's kind of pretty. I have a plastic one with smaller holes in it and it sets in a, a bottom part, just a cheap plastic one. And I really like that a lot. I can drain things and then pick it up from the bowl underneath. And if it's potatoes, although I don't know about you all, we hardly ever have mashed potatoes anymore and they're so good. <laughs> but if I have potatoes, I like to use that potato water in bread. It's so potato water and bread really makes good bread. So that's a colander. We're going to move this over. 
a cookie scoop so that you have uniform size cookies. You can also use this for melon, and, um, but just for uniformity. And then here's another size grater. And the reason I like this grater, I guess you can see it has feet on it. So it sets up and you can set it over a pie plate or over a dish to grate. You know, you know you're not fighting with the, the way it sets. I used to have a box grater. You know what I mean? The kind, four sides and the whole, different size holes on all the sides and you can hold on to the top. And I thought, oh, it takes up too much room and I got rid of it. I wish I still had that box grater because it's so much handier to hold on to the top of it and grate. So someday I might go to a secondhand store and look for an old fashioned box grater. Okay, a good set of kitchen knives. Just, you know, and keep them sharp. We have three children. When we go to visit our children, they always want me to bake and cook. Two of them have the dullest knives, and it's just, it's just a fight to try to chop vegetables with a, to chop a carrot with a dull knife, or um, just a good set of, keep your knives nice and sharp. And this one, I brought this one in because of the serrated edge. This, um, this is good for bread. Um, I, and I like it, and not expensive. I remember it cost $12, but I've had it 30 years. So just something that works. Here was something I just read in Martha Stewart, in Martha Stewart's Living last spring, and she talked about an offset spreader. And I thought, do I really want, I don't think I really need that, but okay, I saw one, I bought it. I love this offset spreader. It's great for frosting cinnamon rolls, cupcakes, cakes. It's really handy and nice for leveling things off when you're measuring. So that's handy. Um, a thermometer. When I started making bread 45 years ago, I thought, hey, you know, the recipes say thump it till it sounds hollow. I'd thump it and think, is that hollow? Is that hollow? And I couldn't, I could never figure it out. Well, then I got a thermometer. Oh, five years ago, I love my thermometer. This, um, you know that with uh, French bread or artisan bread or a bread that isn't real rich, doesn't have eggs and milk, you want it 200 degrees. With a whole wheat bread, and we'll talk more about breads next week, you, um, and cinnamon rolls 195 degrees. This one is a thermopan, and it was more expensive. It was the first one I got, and then the battery went dead, and we must have been looking on the wrong site because the battery was almost as expensive as a new uh, thermometer. So my husband found one for $14.99 or $13.99, and it's called G Dealer. It's all one word, G-D-E-A-L-E-R. And it is great. I love it. I, if, I, if this one, if I drop it and totally break this one, I would just keep my, I do have a G Dealer. This one is a little faster. And you do have to temper it or um, you have to get it accurate by, it tells online how to do it, put in hot water and then plunge it in ice water. But I, I really like my thermometer. Here is a, a spice grater. You know when you want to spice, cardamom, uh, cumin seeds, whatever, something says grind up seeds. And the brand of this one is Nika. Kuhn Recon, yeah, and they're made in Switzerland, and because everything's so expensive in Switzerland, <laughs> these are a little bit pricey, but it's by far the best, best spice grater that I've had. Um, just, uh, it has a ratchet on it, works really well. Okay, a good pair of kitchen shears, and I use this cutting parchment, cutting parsley, uh, herbs, uh, Chicken, you want it strong enough that you can cut through chicken uh, joints, chicken bone joints. So a good pair of uh, kitchen shears. Here's a spoon with a flat bottom, and I believe they have these at Ace Hardware for stirring. Most, a lot of my cookware, I don't use Teflon at all, but a lot of my cookware has a finish on it, and I can't use metal, so I have to use uh, a, a silicone or wood. So I, I have another, I have this with a flat bottom on that I like. So those are nice to have. 
Here's something I always show in my classes. I never use it, but my classes are always uh, seem to be really happy to know about this. You can buy spatulas that are split, so you can clean beaters, and they're more expensive. So I bought a cheaper spatula, and then just cut it to open it. I don't know if you can come a little closer on some of these and, and clean the beaters with uh, that. That's something you can do. As I said, I never use it. I, I get in with my finger most of the time and clean my beaters with clean hands. <laughs> okay, a good ladle. And this, this was, thank you, Alana. This was a Christmas gift. This is a, a GIR too. So you can be up to 500 degrees with this, but it's nice to have a ladle with a sloped handle. And by the way, I have a handout. Your handout tells lists all these tools. I think, are there any? I do have something that's not on there, and I'll tell you when I come to it. Um, but a, a good ladle you need. Uh, reusable bowl covers. I'm trying really hard not to use plastic. It's impossible to not. I'm sure it's not impossible, but. I, you have to use plastic sometimes, but as much as possible, I'm trying not to use so much saran wrap. And I have several, and this is Alana again, a friend, a wonderful friend keeps me in good things. And, and I've noticed I use a lot less saran since I've been using. Yes, Kathy? What's the process of saran wrap? It takes a thousand years for plastic to disintegrate. I know we won't be around in a thousand years, but I just want to, yes. Uh -huh. This the brand of this? Oh, um, True Nature. And she got it online. They also, you can also get those covers, you know, that form a seal when you set them on a bowl. They're so strong. But, and you know, our grandmas used to have the kind of plastic with elastic, they look like shower caps. You know, just anything that's reusable. It saves us money too, in the long run. Besides, besides saving the environment. Okay, then this I find handy too. It's like a sieve, um, but I often have to, you know, scoop something out. When I make noodles, I might decide I don't wanna have to drain that whole pan just to, to scoop it out. You can get online and get these things from uh, William Sonoma, um, uh, Sir La Taube, or but eat, just go to like Ace Hardware and, and stroll around. Uh, Baker's Catalog, I'm going to talk to you about Baker's Catalog, also has a lot of things. Here's another, a little sieve I like I, um, for powdered sugar. You know how when your powdered sugar sets a, a month or so, it gets kind of lumpy, but you can sift with this. And uh, some recipes say sift a, a white sauce or sift, not sift it, but strain it. And this is a nice little strainer. And of course, I have a big uh, flour sifter that I use too. You can sift flour with this too. And then a set of tongs is nice to have. Um, uh, just, well, you know what tongs would be for, but it's just nice to have a good set of tongs. And as I said, you don't need all of these things. You can cook fine without them, but they're things that I really find handy. And those first six items. then a baking mat. And I know I talked in your classes about this, Kathy. I've used baking mats for a long time. Silpat, they're reusable. I never grease a cookie sheet. If it says grease it, I use a lots of parchment. Parchment or um, the Silpat. They say you can use them up to a thousand times. And I had one, I remember where we were when I bought it, so I know it was the year 2000. And last winter, I started looking at it, and I thought, oh my gosh, it's changed color. And I know that uh, plastic can be a carcinogenic. I don't know if silicone is a type of plastic, but anyhow, I decided it was time to throw it away. I have four of these because I use them a lot. Um, I don't put meat on them. When I'm doing anything with meat or pizza, I use parchment. But here's another reusable. And then uh, cutting mats. And these come, the ones I bought, I have two sets, um, came in sets of four, and they were white, red, yellow, green. So I used the white one for onions and garlic, and the white, yellow one for bread, the red one for meat, and the green one for vegetables. And of course, I wash them and put them in the dishwasher, but onions can still have a little residual, or garlic, so 
I, I like those maps too. Then here's something brand new. I need to get another drink. Oh, I see something else I missed here. <laughs> oh, I'm caught up. I hope I didn't, I didn't pull the microphone off, did I? Nope, I got caught on the door handle. But, um, this was in Martha Stewart Living. My neighbor gets Martha Stewart Living and brings me over her red magazines. And it talked about Swedish dishcloths. And they're made of cellulose. And it said one can last as long or be used as much as 58 rolls of paper towels. I love these. The first, this, you see, these are brand new ones. I, and I just got, my neighbor gave me two for, or three for Christmas, single ones. So then I got online. I put in Swedish dishcloths, and I think they were $14.99 for 10 of them. And it said, wash it in soapy water first. You can lay it in the dishwasher. You can sterilize it in the microwave. It tells you on the package. I think it was for 30 seconds. You can put it in the washing machine. You can use these over and over and over. And they're, they're, they're so nice, the texture of them. It's just, they're, they're better than a dishcloth. And used for dishes, for wiping up the counters, and that you can sterilize them that way. So that's something I, I'm real I'm happy that's brand new I'm happy to know about them and then a mandolin back to tools I um, it's nice to have a mandolin for slicing vegetables um, but this one has several plates I think most of them have different plates that you can put in to get you can either dice or slice but make sure you use a guard voice of experience you get to the bottom of that <laughs> carrot or that Cucumber before you know it, and, and uh, you can cut a little end of your finger off pretty quickly. So that's it for tools. Does anybody have a favorite tool I'd like to know about? What couldn't you live without? <laughs> oh, your spaghetti, yep. With the fingers up. I, yep, I did, you're right. I have one. I use mine a lot. You, if you have a lot of pasta, especially, yeah. If anybody thinks of something later, just say, shout it out. So, Okay, I'm going to talk now about a, some of my favorite um, ingredients. And, Kathy, this is not new to you, but um, first of all, vanilla. And what I tell my classes... I'm talking so much here. Buy the best ingredients you can afford. That doesn't mean you buy the most expensive because it isn't always the most expensive that's best. And my best example of that is Lehigh Flour. There's a, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Lehigh Flour Mills up by Salt Lake City. It costs, I believe, it's seven ninety nine for twenty five pounds of flour, and if you com it might be eight ninety nine. If you compute that, it's about two dollars for five pounds. And if I can't get King Arthur, then another brand that I buy, they have at Costco, and it's called Central Milling, and that's from Logan, Utah, which is the oldest flour mill in Utah. And they have it at Costco, 20 pounds is ten ninety nine. So there you're talking about two fifty, two sixty for five pounds. If I can't get either one of them, if I'm back in the east or back in the you know, visiting kids and they don't have Lehigh or Central Milling, then I buy King Arthur and it's about five seventy nine for five pounds. But the best of all is Lehigh flour. I went into uh, Harmon's a year or so ago and talked to him. I just happened, one of the managers was bagging groceries and I said, do you ever carry, would you ever carry Lehigh flour? And he said, no, you know, we don't carry it in bulk. But he said, I have to tell you, all the flour used in the uh, Harmon stores is Lehigh flour for all their baking. And he said, they've saved Lehigh flour mills from going bankrupt. And we just got a Utah Life magazine a couple days ago, and they were talking about Bayo pies. Am I saying it right? Is it Bayo? Is that Bayo? 
they use all Lehigh flour in their pies. So that was interesting. So if you can get Lehigh flour, and I, people, I have neighbors who come down from, who are snowbirds, and they bring me, or, or people will bring me flour from Lehigh, but that's best of all. And by the way, they filmed the movie Footloose in that, Footloose in that um, mail. The first time I went up there, I um, asked, I said, oh, I was so excited, and I thought it was going to be a real cosmic operation. It's just a little building, a little tiny showroom. And I said, could I go through the mill? And they said, oh, no, we couldn't have the public in there. Well, I thought, yeah, I'm glad they can't. I wouldn't want people breathing all over my flower, and especially, especially now. So, yeah, and I first heard about Lehigh flower when we moved here eight years ago, our neighbor was a bachelor, and he did so many nice things for us, and I would bake bread for him, and he said, you know, I wish you'd go to Kanab. There's a little restaurant right on the main street, and it's across from the restaurant with all the cowboy pictures. Have you all been to Kanab? And it's like Johnson's or Peter's. It's a Scandinavian name, and you can have as many of their rolls as you can eat. And he said, I would like to know what's in those rolls. So we went in, they came out with a big plate of rolls, and they are delicious, and they're hot, of course, and they serve them with butter. And I said, do you share the recipe? And they said, oh, no. But I have to tell you, we do use Lehigh flour in all of our rolls. And you know, then, I, I, the more I thought about it, I think it's just a simple roll that they make with flour, flour, sugar, and salt in water. That's why you can, they're cheap. So that's why you can eat as many as you want, but they're delicious. So that's, the, that's my Lehigh flour spiel. Okay, then I'll go to something more expensive, vanilla. I think vanilla is so important. And this Cook's is really good. This butt, this little bottle is $79.99. Vanilla, and price, good vanilla, real vanilla. There was, I don't know if it was a blight, or a mold. And then um, I read an article, they have to hand pollinate all the vanilla. I believe it takes three years before it finally produces, but there's a reason it's so expensive. But it's just so much better. And if you can't get, and for cookie, they have a special, you can get it online, you can get a special cookie vanilla, and it's very mellow. I wish I could bring things, bake things, but we're just not allowed to do that now. But it's really, it's just so good. If you can't get cooks, and you can get regular, um, what's it called, bourbon vanilla, I think, um, that's cooks too. But there's also Nielsen Massey, and Harmons carries that. And there's a new vanilla they've been talking about in cooking magazines, they've been running an ad, maybe you've all seen it, Hailala, H-E-I-L-A-L-A. -L -A. And I sent for some of their uh, vanilla beans. And most of their ads have a coupon for 20% off. And I sent for some of their vanilla beans and they were so moist and pungent. They, they were very good. So if you're in, if you make homemade ice cream and want vanilla beans, I'd recommend the Hailala vanilla beans, but this is one of my, I just can't live without cookie vanilla. What about Mexican vanilla? Well, you know, it's good too. Yeah, and it's not as expensive, although it's gotten, it's like, I, do you know, is it like $30 for a bottle this size? Oh gosh, it's so, I guess I got the imitation because it was only like $8. Oh, did you get it in Mexico though? Oh, okay, that makes a difference. Yeah, you were able to get it there. So no, it could be that much, um, real vanilla would be that much there. I bought some once in the duty-free shop, leaving Mexico, and we had to go through a change, and I had a quart. I bought for our neighbors, I had three bottles, and it was, it was I think, only $3 a bottle. But um, we had to switch flights in Houston, and had to recheck our bags. They took all my vanilla. I said, I bought it in the duty-free shop. And they said, well, they don't care. <laughs> so I lost that vanilla. But I, you know, and you know by what, what you, if it tastes good, then I, yeah, it, that'd be good. I just don't have, I know they do have it at Red Barn and at Fry's, they have Mexican vanilla. So, yeah, so, okay, but it's more expensive than $8. <laughs> 
Okay, uh, spices. I like pansy spices. Are any of you familiar with pansies? They're only, av no, I, I was going to say they're only available online. That's not true. There are stores, but we don't have any here in Salt Lake, so I always get mine online, and they run lots of specials. It, um, I don't know how much, it varies, of course, in prices, but it's at least five or six dollars a bottle, but then you can get free shipping, you can get a free bonus, and all kinds of little things, but I do like Pensy Spices. Um, here's another Utah product, Real Salt. I love Real Salt. No additives, no preservatives. And I read an article, not, pre not published by Real, it was published by an independent person, that, and I don't know how this works, but it said it's actually good for your blood pressure. I've, you know, we all know we're not supposed to have salt, but um, it is, this is more expensive. Shoot, how much did I pay for this? I think about $9.95 for this. But I do like it, and they have all different. They have coarse for meat, and they have fine grind, and yeah, I definitely like uh, the real salt. I buy all that, and I also always use Eglin's Best Eggs. This is somewhere else that I splurge. And the reason I do, a few years ago, it was in 2007, I was in a cake competition, and it was chiffon cakes. Does anybody remember chiffon cakes? From way, they were way back from the 50s. I don't even remember when they used to make them. But each chiffon cake has eight to 10 eggs in it. And I, was, I made 28 cakes to practice for that competition. I didn't win, by the way. <laughs> but I made 28 cakes, and I did it over a short period of time. It was like over six weeks. I was making a cake almost every day, and thought, oh my goodness, it's getting so expensive because we we're giving all the cakes away. You know, I'd cut a piece to see how it was and give the rest away. So I thought, I'm going to use cheaper eggs. So I used some cheaper eggs. There was such a difference between the height of those two eggs or those cakes. And if you want to test that, if you have some cheaper eggs at home and want to get some Eglin's Best, crack an egg in a bowl, an Eglin's Best, and then put the other one and just look how the two set in there. Just take a look at those two eggs and see if, if you don't agree, maybe Eglin's Best is a superior egg. So, I guess I um, that and that can have to do with freshness, but the other ones just kind of run. The yolks aren't as yellow, and that has to do with the diet of the chicken. There just is a difference. Yeah. And American recipes are tested with large size eggs. So um, I, I tend to use extra large more often. I'll look at the price, but more often if, uh, if they're close in price, I'll use extra large because I think eggs that are now extra large used to be what used to be large size. I think they aren't as big as they used to be. So, okay, that's, that's my supplies and ingredients. Okay, then I want I, I'm I am going to keep you about an hour today. Oh, it's taking me longer than I thought, but I have more things to tell you here. So, but I, it won't be much over an hour today. I want to talk to you about my favorite cooking magazines. My all-time favorite is Cooks. I've I think I've been through all the cooking magazines, but Cooks is really. Um, they have no ads in them, um, and beautiful covers. And, uh, they test recipes. For example, because bread is the thing I know best, um, I remember the article on cinnamon rolls. And they said, okay, what happens if you use milk in the cinnamon rolls? What happens if you use 2% or whole milk? What if happens if you use water? What if you use three eggs or two eggs? What if you need it more? What if you let them rest? after a, a batter, they do all kinds of things with the recipe, and then they publish the final recipe. But they do that with everything. They do it with meat, with vegetables, with cookies, with, with everything. But then they also have a section on best products. You know, like, what's the best cookie sheet? And these are the brands we recommend. These are the ones we recommend with reservation. These are the ones don't recommend. Or best uh, can opener, best salt. Just best everything, it's, it's, they're scientifically founded. And they were first, um, Christopher Kimball 
do people I thought he died but people say oh no he's on and he's I I have a later story about Christopher oh did I no yeah Christopher Kimball but he used to be the editor and he wrote the best articles in the, on the front page he's a bit of a philosopher and then he just disappeared a few years ago and I thought oh he must have died but he didn't they have somebody new who's the editor but it's a beautiful mag beautiful covers excellent information I, I love I'll always get this magazine it's about twenty four ninety five for six issues in a year but usually around Christmas time they run a special you can get a friend a, a, a subscription for half off or they do little things to make it a little talk to a friend and split the cost between you do something but I really like cooks then the other magazine I learned this from a student is baked from scratch and it's all baking and I don't believe they have ads either um, but it's just all baking and good recipes I like it a lot I used to get um, taste of home they don't test those recipes you know you can I know a lot of people get good recipes from them and that's fine but um, Bon Appetit I often I don't like the recipes I um, but that's all my personal opinion and I, I like Martha Stewart but um, I, I well those are the only two cooking catalogs magazines I get anymore I used to get tea time I got it for probably four or five years it's a great little magazine it has beautiful covers and then they show all kinds of pretty dishes and table settings but it's mostly scone recipes and little tea sandwich recipes and after four or five years I don't need any more scone recipes so I decided I think I'm, I think I'll give up on on tea time maybe I'll start again because it's fun to look through it and it has travel items Here's the new magazine that Christopher Kimball started, Milk Street. And I subscribe to that. I think I've gotten it two years. But and it, it's good, and he still does his little philosophy in the front. But the recipes are kind of, are like a lot of them are from India, uh, from the Far East, the Mideast, and from Africa with weird spices. And that's just, we don't tend to like the recipes. You know, I go out and buy coconut milk and all the things that they ask for and, and we don't really like the recipes so I've decided not to continue getting that one but you, um, if somebody wants to try it I have two magazines I really or catalogs I really like King Arthur that comes you know comes from um, or Baker's Cat magazine is it Baker's magazine or cat magazine from King Arthur and I love their products they're they're tending to you uh, push a lot of their um, like enhancers that I don't care about and their mixes but they do have a lot of good supply or good products and you can get to that online King Arthur or Baker's catalog.com and they'll send you the catalog and then a Vermont country store are you all familiar with that I got that from a student too love the you know the ribbon candy at Christmas time and lemon drops and root beer candies and old flannel nightgowns and um, I bought our grandsons a jack-in-the-box and the top toys I just had forgotten about so it's a fun one to get to my what's everybody's favorite cookbook I'm going to talk to you my favorite cookbooks but do you have a favorite cookbook That's, yep, that's on my list. <laughs> the old Betty Crocker, the old uh, Better Homes and Gardens, but the ones from like 60, 1960, not the new ones, because they tend to use a lot of mixes. And I also like Cook's uh, Best Recipe. It's related to Cook's Magazine. Or if you can have a community or a church cookbook that people send in their favorite recipes. I notice I tend to go back to the same. When a friend of mine died, who, she was a wonderful baker. She was an older lady. Her daughters brought her her recipe file in, and everybody who came to the funeral could pull out a recipe from Rosie. And I thought that's so nice. I think I want to do have that done when I die. <laughs> Let people have my own recipes. <laughs> so, okay. Then I read it. That was best cookbook. Um, I read an article. Is it better to use a stand mixer 
or a portable mixer? And it, what do you think would be better? Stand. That's what you would think. It said you can get equal results from a equally good, that you doesn't have to be a stand, you can get it from a portable. Do you all have kitchen aids by chance? Okay. You know that um, I've I notice that my KitchenAid, my, um, I, I use my KitchenAid a lot. In fact, I'm on my third one, but there's nothing, no problem with KitchenAid. I'd run it on a transformer when we lived in Germany. So that's very hard on them. But I noticed that my beaters and this, do you know the one that kind of looks like a, like a heart that, for cookies? When I'd take the, the beater off, there'd be flour down in the bottom of the bowl that wasn't getting mixed in or butter, you can adjust your beater. After so long, there's like a little spring at the top that when you put the beater in, that spring moves up. You can get online and, and it's, I put it in your handout. It says uh, KitchenAid adjust bowl clearance and put in your model number and on mine, mine is the kind that um, I have a lever that goes up and down with the bowl. And we had to get in and adjust the screw on it. But some of them, the screw is underneath when you lift the mixer up, if you lift the mixer up. But it'll tell you online what you need to do to adjust your beater. So it'll come down and clean the bottom of your bowl better. Okay. So now I can talk about baking tips. Do you need, does anybody need to get up and stretch? Are you getting tired of sitting or are you okay? Okay, I'll talk about general tips. And so that I'm not reading from it, everything is on here, but I want to go through it. And then I'd like you to please um, interject anything that you might have. Um, when you're mixing, here's, here are things I think of. If you're starting with a new recipe, read through it. Have you ever been working on, you know, you're on a brand new recipe and you're cooking all your flour and milk or whatever, and then it says, immediately add to the eggs that have been beaten until lemon colored. And I say, oh my goodness, I can't get them lemon colored. My, I'm going to cool off. Well, if you'd read ahead, you could do everything in the right order. Set all your ingredients out and set your supplies out and have things in the order you're going to use them. It makes things so much, makes them work so much better. It makes it just, it keeps you from forgetting things. It makes it so much more efficient. And when you start, put some hot soapy water in your sink and then just drop your dishes in there as you go. Even if you're going to put them in the dishwasher later. If you do a lot of things with flour, and I'm thinking of bread, and I do, Soak your dishes in cold water, not in hot water. If you soak your bread dough dishes in hot water, it bakes that dough on, and then you have to almost scrape it off. If you soak them in cold water, that flour dissolves off there. Eggs should be uh, room temperature, except for meringue. Then you want your eggs nice and cold for meringue. But I set my eggs out like 10 or 15 minutes before, and it's good to whisk the eggs when you use some. Ingredients should always be about room temperature when you're baking. Flour, or butter should be uh, 60 to 65 degrees uh, to have it ready to use for most things. Now for pie, dough, and biscuits, you want your shortening very cold. So again, it depends on what you're making. Um, uh, let me see. Toast nuts before you bake with them most of the time. And I toast them in a skillet. I just get a skillet hot and then just keep stirring, stirring, stirring to get them toasted. There are some times that I don't want the, egg, the, to the nuts toasted. It brings out the flavor more. But for some reason, I think in brownies, you don't want to toast. I don't, that's just my personal preference. I don't want the walnuts toasted in brownies. I don't know why I have that idea, but I do. If you're going to work with a dried fruit, shake it, take a tablespoon of flour out of the flour measurement and sprinkle that or shake your dried fruit in that to keep it suspended through your dough, like raisins or whatever you're going to, to be mixing. 
Okay, I talked about Lehigh flour, I talked about Cook's bakeware. You should use the size that the recipes recommend. I've um, ruined plenty of things by not using the right size. And for bakeware, I don't like Teflon at all. For cookies, it's nice to have a shiny surface and a dull bottom. Um, dark cookware tends to burn things. So if you have a dark cookie sheet, set a second sheet on the shelf underneath. For pies, I prefer a clear glass pie dish. You know, they have the cutest little pottery pie plates, but I don't think they bake as well. If I, if my, and I often break something, I would go to a secondhand store or Deseret or wherever and get some old glass cookware. The older glass cookware is heavier than the new that's coming out, I think. So, okay. And uh, quick breads, you know, like banana bread, have a different size pan. The quick bread pan is, is bigger. It's five by nine, and a bread pan is four and a half by eight and a half. So you should use the right pan. I, I also, I want, needed a new angel food cake pan. I went to a garage sale and found the old aluminum. I, it works better. I think it's better than so much of the new things. Okay, tips for baking better cookies. Um, nearly all cookie recipes, and I might be wrong, there might be some different, but generally you start out by creaming your butter, and there you want your butter 60 to 65, with the sugar. You can over cream it. it. The right amount of time is about five minutes. And if you cream it too much, it, it introduces too much air in your cookies and it makes them more cake-like than cookie-like. Um, uh, if you have several pans of cookies going, make sure they completely cool before you add the, the cookie, cookie shapes on it because that makes it run. And it's a good idea even to put your cookie on the sheet, cookies on the sheet, put them in the dough, raw dough, in the refrigerator for 10 to 15 minutes, and then they'll set up better before you make them. If you're rolling cookie dough out to make cutouts, roll it out between two sheets of wax paper. And I told you I always use a baking mat or parchment paper. And I think that, oh, and rotate the pans. I have a new Wolf oven, and I had a, a, a Bosch that I loved, but it, it wasn't repairable because it was 14 years old, and it was the wrong size. So I thought, you know, I don't splurge on anything else. Well, poor me, I sound like I'm complaining. I'm not complaining, but I'm going to buy myself a Wolf oven. I have not liked that Wolf nearly as well as I like the Bosch. It has hot spots in it, the little button on the microwave, I thought, well, while I'm at it, replace the microwave. I wish I hadn't done that. The little button has broken on the microwave, and they're coming to repair it. It's under warranty. But I have to rotate things, and I didn't used to have to in my Bosch. So, um, but it, it's not a big deal. It's just you have to rotate whatever you're making in it. Okay, with, uh, oh, and when you're making cookies or cakes or biscuits or pie, you don't want to overwork the flour. And you know there are two different kinds of flour. There's the bread flour, and if you buy at Lehigh, it's the turkey flour, and it's higher protein. And that makes your product more chewy. Whereas cookies are, um, you don't want them chewy, and you don't want cake chewy, so don't overmix cookies, cakes, or pies. Um, Measure, for cakes, measure all ingredients very carefully because with cakes, more than anything, it's a, a formula. It's a proportion, so you need to be careful about that. And cake flour is even lower protein than all-purpose flour. I think you know when you frost it, if you're doing a layer cake, put wax paper, four little squares of wax paper and slip it out. Probably everybody knows that. Okay, on pies, um, I put my favorite pie recipe in here, and it's a very short recipe, but it's hard to fail. Pie, my pie crust. It's a fourth, a cup and a fourth of flour to uh, three-fourths cup of Crisco. 
and it, it always turns out. And I always add a little sugar because it makes it brown better. But that's a really, it's a very good crust recipe. I think you'd be happy with it. You don't want to over mix the flour, get the flour and butter mixed. And there you want the butter or the shortening very cold and then add ice water to it. And then when you roll it out, roll from the center out. Don't go back and forth over it. That'll make it tough. And don't roll over the edges of the pie dough. Just roll up to the edge. And that helps keep it nice and flaky. And then a friend came over um, and right before I taught the other class, and she said, I was making a lemon meringue pie. It was just turning out beautifully. So I got ready for the meringue, and I beat it and beat it and beat it. I could not get the meringue to set up. Do you all know what she was doing wrong, probably? Warming. Well, that, that can make a difference with it. The other thing, um, you know what? They are, I, I told you the wrong thing. Eggs, egg white should be lukewarm for the, uh, yeah, for the meringue. Yes, they should be lukewarm. But I think what it was, I told her whenever I make a meringue pie, I set out the bowl, I'm going to mix them in. I set out the measuring cup. I set out the um, beaters and the spatula, everything I'm going to use, and pour boiling water over it. If there's one bit of oil, you know, or one bit, even from your finger, from lotion, that can cause the, the keep the meringue from uh, getting nice and stiff. Or if you get a spot of egg yolk in it, there's no saving that egg white for meringue. You just, just can't do it. You know, I have to, I'm thinking about that. I, I told you the wrong thing. I think the egg whites should be nice and cold when you're making meringue. Okay. I've, I've always used warm. I've oh, heck. Set up my eggs. Yeah, I think keep. I think they are to be warm. Yeah, I don't. I wasn't really thinking. And it's what I'm with whipped cream. You want it nice and cold, but the eggs should be uh, room temperature, left out for ten to fifteen minutes. Okay, for biscuits and scones, uh, that's like pie crust. You just want to keep them nice and. Uh, you don't want to over mix them. Blend the the shortening and flour together. And if you want uh, soft sides, then um, let them touch when they bake. If you, want the, if you want them crispy all around, then separate them in the baking pan. And I think that's everything I wanted to tell you today. What about you all? Do you have any tips? I'd love to have any tips you'd like to share. Well, good. And anybody on in uh, YouTube land, please send any questions, any comments, anything you want me to cover next week. And for that third class, we will do what you want. As I told you, I'm planning to talk about sourdough, artisan bread, and then do different shapes. But we can do whatever you want. I'm going to check. I just started a new starter, and I have, it's just multiplying like crazy. I'd love to share it, but I don't know if I'm allowed to. So I'm, I'm going to find out from our director if it's possible, if anybody wants sourdough starter. Is anybody working with sourdough at home? Would you like to or not really? Yeah, we, okay. We'll certainly talk about it, and, and um, yeah, and I, I can tell you where you can get a starter if they won't, if I can't share, but I'll ask and see what we can do about it. If I put it in a sealed jar, and I, we'll see what happens. So, okay, that's, was that just about an hour and two minutes? Yeah, so, good, job. good <laughs> fast talking, huh? And, um, I kind of, it's hard to breathe through the mass, is it, is it? Do you feel like, yeah. I'm, I'll get my bass back on now, and I think I can, I need to turn this off. I think, yeah.